to start, let's start off with the, the because we're pretty familiar with Diego, right? Um, we all have seen your uh, your uh, motorcycles around the city. I don't know. I'm not a motor guy, so like I don't know if motorcycle is the right word. I think it's a scooter or a mobility yeah. vehicle. It's it's called yeah moped. I think moped. Yeah, uh, because scooter uh, has been challenged a little bit uh, in the in the past months with the other smaller version on the side. In Spanish way. we call patinete. Exactly. But how do you call them in English? It's like the so other scooter. Yeah, it's scooter and moped. Moped would be ours. But I'm the kind of person who signed up for Diego one year ago, two years ago, to learn how to ride a moped. Never been on a motorbike myself. And in February 2020, bad time around to do it. So I'm kind of like this guy who signs up for the gym and never goes. Yeah. <laughs> At least I haven't paid. Let, let, let's go back to the, to, to the story, to the early beginnings. So first I want to know, like, in your family, right, has there been the entrepreneurial gene or not? How did you discover entrepreneurship? What motivated you to create a company in the first place? Um, so no, no, um, there is definitely no, no gene in my family. So um, I'm coming from, I'm French, first of all, I'm, I'm 33. Um, and uh, no, I was working in a corporate automotive company in Germany uh, before creating that company. Um, so now the moment that, that basically made click is, um, was in 2015, uh, and I think it was because we had the right co-founders, the right team of friends, the right idea, and it was also the right moment for us on, on a personal and, and professional um, level, let's say. Because one of the things we're trying to do at Startup Brain is to inspire other people by sharing some success stories, right? Because often, like, we're trying to get more people into technology, into startups, because, I don't know, when I grew up as a kid, my role models were football players, I'm not going to lie, right? And if we want to bring more people into technology, and especially, for instance, also more women into technology, they need to have more role, player, uh, more role models, right? Who are your role models and where, what were you inspired by? Um, I mean, there were several, I think. Um, I, was, I had been working for Tesla in the past, so I, I had the chance to meet Elon Musk and to wow. set up a, uh, the first Tesla store in France. And obviously this person inspired me, me a lot, but let's say there was also uh, lots of, of, of content from, from French startup ecosystem that were available online um, and from a community called The Family that still exists. Yeah. Um, which were super inspiring, and I think was yeah that that kind of a momentum also where uh, uh, startup content and 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 stories of entrepreneur got shared massively, and um, this really kind of yeah inspired us to work first basically on the first idea, then on the second, and the third one was the one that was big enough and and where we were passionate enough as well to just drop jobs and change country and. And, and start a company for real. I'm going to go into that in a second, but you mentioned somebody that's really important in the French ecosystem, which is the family. Actually, they came to Barcelona. They established here for a while. Didn't work. But I'm curious about your perspective, because we do have other examples of French entrepreneurs, you being one, the guy from Cantox, Philippe, for instance. We've got uh, Monsen uh, from Blablacar, who's doing Consentia right now, and other French entrepreneurs in the city. What, what is like... What do French people see in Barcelona as positive, and what is stopping other French people from being more entrepreneurial in Barcelona, or creating more companies here? Um, so no, I think like what, what's attractive in Barcelona is is attractive not just for French people, for for everyone. I think the yeah, but you're closer. Yeah, maybe we are closer. Yeah. I think the language is a little bit easier when you're French, also to to switch to, or lots of French people um, uh, know Spanish, uh, have learned Spanish. Um, and yeah, it's it's a very I mean it's 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 super close yeah super easy and uh, super good quality of life I mean um, what makes French people maybe not come to Barcelona for now I think it's probably the size of the startup ecosystem in Paris because <laughs> it's bigger uh, which is also one of the reasons why why the family l in the end didn't establish in, in in Barcelona and they opened two offices one in London and one in Berlin. Um, just because the size was a little bit bigger and, 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 and yeah, they, they made this decision. Uh, I mean, but it's, it's up to everybody and, and each one how, yeah, how, how good it feels in, in a particular city and an ecosystem. And in our case, it was also kind of a business decision. I mean, we were, we were driven by Barcelona was the right city for us to do. 
uh, the startup that we wanted to do um, back then. But uh, and there were many constraints. I, I didn't speak Spanish at all. The only Spanish, uh, Spanish speaking person was Tim, uh, one of the three co-founders. Um, so it wasn't really the easiest option, uh, but it was the one that we uh, decided to choose. Yeah. And why did you decide to start here with all like the, these difficulties going on? I mean, it's always a balance between... Because there were a lot of players, actually. I mean, Kultra was pretty strong back in the day. Actually, we launched two weeks before Kultra. All oh, right, all oh, right. But we were less visible because we had three scooters and they launched with 150, I think. Uh -huh. um, you launched with three. We launched with three, okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah. There are uh, lots of, of small stories, but yeah, I mean, um, we picked Barcelona. We were actually living in Munich in Germany, so we weren't even in, in, in France, and uh, we were looking for change, so we wanted to leave Germany anyway, and then for the activity of moped sharing, we wanted to go somewhere where it was already very much implemented culturally. And we, I mean, <clears throat> the two big capitals in terms of mopeds driving is Rome, and Barcelona, and um, I mean, Barcelona has definitely a bigger ecosystem than Rome in terms of startups and, and financing, and Barcelona is super interesting as well because it's super diverse uh, in terms of population, so you can test stuff very quickly on, on tourists, on residents, on expats, um, so it's, it's uh, super accessible, uh, and to, to do tests is really great, and then in our perspective, again, in terms of um, urban innovation. Uh, the city of Barcelona also is very active. You've probably seen the Super Islas and a lot of initiatives looking, uh, pioneering here in Barcelona and that a lot of other cities are looking at. That's also why we have the Smart City World Congress here in Barcelona. Lots of, lots of good vibes and, and energy, um, I feel. Yeah, I totally buy that. And I think Barcelona is great to kind of like sort of like start up some projects and we can be pretty flexible about things and it's good to experiment. And, and then once you scale up, traditionally after Series A, you would go somewhere else because investors are better somewhere else. However, Barcelona has been pretty strict also on urban mobility, right? And last mile deliveries, lots of regulations, lots of changes. And I, I, I don't have it top of my head right now, but I remember two, three years ago, I think, they limited the number of scooters and mopeds that could be on the street, where they could park, where not, the number of licenses. How did that affect you? And um, it did definitely affect us quite a lot. You were speaking of ups and downs. That was definitely kind of a momentum uh, important for us. Okay. Was, uh, it was actually not that far. It was in February 2020. Oh, right. Uh, so we were actually... Best month ever for you guys. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the, 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 the cool one. Uh, and we, we, we closed our Series A in, in December 2019, so three, two, three months before. So we were super pumped, super motivated. And in February, uh, yeah, there, there was kind of a, a small scandal around the number of operators that applied and, 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 and arrived to the city of Barcelona, which was bigger than the amount of all operators in common in Europe. So uh, and we were a bit surprised, and obviously the consequence was that every, because it was an equal spreading of the licenses, so if you had 50 operators, you would split them equally between 50. And there were, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, 21 at the beginning. Uh, so we were like, wow, from 5 to 21, what where happened? are this company coming from, right? So, um, well, and, and yeah, that, that meant for us reducing quite significantly our fleets. Um, so we, yeah, we had to investigate and, and, and wait a little bit to see what was really happening. And basically 30 days later, COVID came. And within three days, we lost 97% of our revenues. <laughs> um, so it was kind of, yeah, high and then directly Sound down. low, yeah. like well, Nice plummeting. elevator, yeah. yeah. Right well, we'll go into that a little bit later. I, w I was... I'm curious about the beginnings because I think you also guys changed your name. But I wanted to hear the story about how you find your co-founders because this is a recurring theme in all of our events. Nowadays, it's fucking difficult to get co-founders, especially technical ones. Where did you find yours and how well do you still get along with them after so many years? That's getting personal. I mean, one of them is here, right? So <laughs> One is here. No pressure. At least one is still, we have still a good relationship. There's only I'm one kidding. here, just saying. <laughs> no, I, I don't know if I'm, I'm a good example for searching for co-founders because uh, we have a very particular story and it's, we've been super lucky. Um, 
It started out by basically three friends living in Munich, uh, but we, we all came from the same background, so we actually had done the same business school in, in France. Um, we were we had a little bit different perspective. I was a little bit more kind of a Swiss knife and a little bit more sales maybe. Um, and Tim was much more on the marketing side and Jan, who is the third one, um, had already um, fucked up one startup, but he tried it and then he, wa he, he mentored startups and worked in the, in the startup ecosystem in Berlin. So he brought a little bit more the mindset of uh, uh, entrepreneurship. Um, and obviously that wasn't, good enough, we had no technical skills at all to start the company. Um, and we were super, super lucky because I have a twin brother who is technical and who uh, helped us. And Jan has a twin brother who is technical. So you're technically five. So we are actually six because there is also the small brother of Tim that is right now managing Not Diego a twin brother. In, in Paris. So it's a, yeah. Not the cool person, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Missing out, eh? but yeah. yeah. So no, that, that was like a, a great kind of surprised that they, they actually, we discovered their skills really. Uh, they obviously had job at the beginning, so they were working after, after hours and on weekends to basically build the app, build the, uh, the, the, um, the technology that we were building within the mopeds to, uh, to, to basically talk to our servers. Um, and they did all of that within basically two months um, so that we could start uh, yeah, basically sharing those three vehicles that we just had put on the street. But basi so basically, if I got it right, you got a twin brother that allowed you to pitch at two different startup events at the same time. Is that what you mean? <laughs> no, uh, we look different. That's oh. uh, both. Yeah. All right. Yeah, no. no, just that just kidding. But, but in all seriousness, I'm I'm also very curious about how you guys build technology, right? Because as I said, finding the uh, co-founder is very difficult. Fi finding a CTO right now, or e even a developer. It's fucking insane right now. How did you build your technology? And especially, you have an added difficulty, which is working with hardware, with fucking mopeds. It's not like it's not a SaaS that you just build it, ship it online, and kind of like start building. Not that easy. But you have to build, adapt. Like it's not as easy to iter to iterate a hardware product. How did you do that? Yeah, it's true. I mean, we are we have a pretty complex company and pretty transversal. So it was it's super nice because we're learning lots of stuff. I also discovered regulation lately. Um, too late or too early? <laughs> no, it's never too late. <laughs> um, but no, basically, uh, it's a lot of luck, basically. What happened, for example, on the hardware part, because you mentioned it, is uh, we had just one scooter. It was back in November 20, uh, 2015. And what we did is basically my, my brother and father came to visit by car because they're from Toulouse, three hours from, from Barcelona. And they come basically with a trailer and they took this, the only scooter that we had, the only moped we had, and we, we drove back home for Christmas holiday, the three together. And we basically spent the, whole, the two weeks Christmas holidays trying to make that moped turn on and off with internet and the top case the same and get the battery level out. And it was actually, we did that with Arduino. So lots of people probably know it's like the basics to, to make things work, the IoT kind of developer kit. Um, but yeah, I think we were, well, I was super lucky and we were lucky as uh, the three initial co-founders to have Thomas on board for my, my, my brother and that he, mm, that he was capable to do that. Um, so when I came back, I came back with the trailer, with the moped, but it basically was working. And uh, on, the other, on the other side of, or on the other part of, of, of France, there was basically Jan with his twin brother, and they were working on the web application. So we were not native um, from the beginning. We had, really at the beginning was a web application um, and uh, it was a website basically, and we were requesting users to basically put the website as favorite so that it would appear as an application on the mobile phone. Um, it looks like it, now that I say it, it looks like really, really old. We were we were happy because it was working on Windows phones. Oh. <laughs> That's so the yeah, the time time passes, but um, yeah, we built. It was really an MVP kind of uh, approach, and then we just built what was necessary for people to uh, to take those mopeds um, and pay, um, and that that's it. 
and it was done pretty quickly in the end. Uh, but you did it internally, which is something that's pretty unusual. Maybe it was easier at the time. Or you guys, you, I don't know if, if they were technical enough. They taught themselves. But nowadays, what we see is like a lot of people saying, oh, I'm not going to start my startup because I don't have yet a CTO, which is the wrong way to look at things, if you ask me. But what would be your advice for people who say or claim that they need a CTO to start their company? I think it's always better to start and do things, demonstrate something. And I think also my learning would be, um, even so I didn't go through that experience, is if you want to find a good CTO, you need to demonstrate that you as a non-technical person pushed it super far without any technical skills and demonstrated that there, were, there, there is some kind of demand, there is something that a problem that you're solving. And that is worth for him to uh, really put effort and sacrifice and passion uh, and jump in uh, because CTOs are very much demanded and they will probably have the choice to pick whatever project they want. So if you just come and have a, a random idea but you didn't really execute anything, even so it's difficult, you probably gonna struggle. <laughs> Let's get a little bit uh, more personal here. Um, I'm a huge defender of Barcelona being Barcelonian myself, but I know there's one thing we got to fix. We're not exactly super welcoming for business. And, you know, it's always easier for us Catalans to get it, navigate the industry, the contacts, administration, and whatnot. I'm 100% transparent with that, and that's one of the things I want to change from within, right? What difficulties did you find you as an expat and what can you share so that, because we're mostly experts here, so <laughs> our community maybe is going to learn a lot from this one. I'm not sure. I think uh, most people here or most experts have been going through the same challenges at the beginning. I mean, just getting an EA was a hassle, and we had people at 5 a.m. and Santa Julia waiting, uh, going by moped because you had to be there before the first subway, stuff like that. Um, and then obviously we had a, a little bit of, of struggle at the beginning because... We had to, yeah, we had to go do some formalities, some administrative tasks at Hacienda, and uh, we had to send Tim because he was the only one speaking Spanish. Um, so mm, we did it that way. I think it was a little bit of a struggle, um, but then it, yeah, I think it's something that you learn. Um, and then we also very quickly found a gestor <laughs> and, and, and asked for help uh, because it's, yeah, it's very administrative. It's not the most passionate stuff and it takes time. Um, yeah, no, so I'd say it's, it's doable, but yeah, at the beginning, it's, if you don't speak Spanish, it's, it's quite, quite a, a hurdle, a challenge. Challenging. Yeah. Let's, yeah. let's use a euphemism. <laughs> How about, how about this? Like, I'm curious about the initial team because you mentioned that you have very similar profile, right? And that's something I can relate to. My two co-founders at Marspace were both, we're, the three of us were exactly the same profile. We're three developers. However, we have divided the company in three areas and each one takes like responsibility and the last vote for each one of them, right? How do you divide your responsibilities and duties in the company, in Diego, and how has that evolved over time? Because you mentioned you were a Swiss knife. It's kind of like my profile as well. We ended up being CEOs, right? Yeah, yeah. So I think, um, I mean, we did the usual thing and probably mistake, but I think at the beginning, it's it's there is no way around it. Is meaning that everybody helps each others and and you share lots of responsibilities. Um, then very quickly, I mean, we we just took wherever we were we were best skilled, um, and even so, Tim was speaking Spanish. He wasn't really the guy for operations and stuff, so he he needed to go back to marketing. Um, the discussion for who is going to be a CEO was just like a, a, a discussion with the three of us and it was pretty straightforward. I mean, who I wanted to be CEO, they wanted me to be CEO and right. it was like a 10 minute discussion. It wasn't really a big thing. There was not uh, like any kind of, of fight or, or debate around who's going to be handling it. So that was nice um, or easier to, to handle. And Jan, Jan is, 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 is passionate about building products and building things. So he basically took like the product part and uh, yeah, managing projects, building them, coordinating with tech. Um, and that evolved obviously enormously over time, even so the functions remain more or less the same. I mean, uh, running a company uh, at the beginning, we were swapping batteries, doing the mechanics, answering the customer support, 
24 7. Um, and we were assisting, I was actually on the other side of, of, of the, the room. I was, we were assisting to all startups events, trying to give, um, give in some flyers and get people to subscribe and, and register. And now we are 110 employees in two countries, um, so it's a big organization. I think every every year, or I, I don't know, I don't know exactly when it happens, but yeah, there is a lot of, of work and thinking, which goes just into how we organize ourselves, how we take decisions, how we 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 did a lot of work on how to break the founder myth within the company. Because that's also something that I think. What is the founder myth? Sorry. I, think it, I, I don't know if it's a it's a generic. Uh, um, let's say when you grow a company and you are let's say two or three founders, and so you're dividing responsibilities. Um, let's say you are in charge of marketing, and the guy from product came, and he's the founder in charge of product, and he's just giving his opinion about marketing, you shouldn't be influenced. Uh, but because he's a founder, you're going to take it as a decision or something that is like uh, above uh, your own responsibility. So we had really to clarify a little bit the boundaries of uh, who decides what, um, to what extent, um, and uh, and yeah, and then gradually also an executive committee and stuff like that, that which were important to, uh, to manage the company. But right now, we pretty much kept as founders um, responsibilities we, which are in the field that within we were like um, at the beginning, more or less. When you mentioned the founders myth, I thought it would be something like nobody does things as, uh, nobody's as committed perhaps or can get it right as a founder. Like for instance, hiring, because you know more or better, how, how are the people that you want to hire? You got the culture, because you are the culture, right? And it's hard to pass it down. Eventually it happens, right? Um, I know like a couple of people, key people in our company are like almost semi-founders precisely because of that, because they, they get it, but some people don't, right? And so I wanted to, to get your perspective in this as well. Is this something that also happened in your company or? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a bit hard at the beginning uh, because, yeah, as you say, like the, the, the culture is impregnated from by, by the founders and then it, it becomes a company culture and you have to redefine it so that everybody feels the same values and that it's aligned with what the founders wanted at the beginning. Um, but all of everything is, I think the biggest challenge and the biggest success is finding people um, that gradually get completely in the mindset, completely in the culture, in the values, and you just see the reflection of the, the yeah, of yourself and of the team that you wanted to build, and that's when when you feel really happy because they are becoming relays and, and, and builds up uh, trust, and, and that's, I think, how you start building great teams, uh, but it takes time, obviously. How do you scale, okay, uh, sorry, how do you scale yourself? Because I think we've got a similar profile, I also work as a Swiss army knife in the early stages of my company. And then gradu uh, gradually I became CEO, right? But then you cannot be a Swiss army knife when you're a CEO because basically CEO is 80% of the time doing things you ought to do versus 20% of the time that things that you would like to do, more or less, give or take. And so like for instance, I enjoy a lot doing contracts for instance, and I don't have a legal background, but I enjoy that part, self-taught, right? But but I know my time is not best spent there. I'm not, my time is not best spent developing, for instance. I have to be doing more like PR, events, marketing, and hiring, or things like that, that or sales, essentially, which is the core of my, my role. How did you scale yourself? How did you let go of the things that you enjoyed doing but know are not critical to the success of the company? I mean, that, that's a difficult question, and it's something that took a lot of time, I think. Um, I think it takes a lot of discipline and a little bit of structure and in the organization, basically. Um, but I still continue to feel that I had to run and, 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 and think about stuff that I forgot. And I'm, I'm always in, in that kind of mindset because like, there is al always like, I'm, I'm still responsible for, for the, the managers to feel good, for things to work out, um, but also for fundraising and also contracts. Uh, or public affairs, um, and this is, it's, it's always, I mean, I think the CEO has also a particular role because he's, he needs to jump in on topics when there is nothing at the beginning until you have the capacity financially or as a company 
to um, to recruit people and build a department and then yeah then it's it, it's getting a little bit easier it's just about getting the right people and um, and making it work uh, but um, yeah it's mm, managing time I, I'm not sure if I'm the best guy in 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 time management for myself um, I'm very passionate about what I'm doing um, and uh, I, I set the limits quite high uh, in terms of uh, um, hours investment I think it's but I, I like it that way um, and yeah I think I see everything as a challenge I mean right now for example we don't have a public affair department we probably should already uh, but it's also the mentality of the company uh, it's a little bit like the, the mechanics at the beginning I mean we like to do things and struggle a little bit doing them uh, because that way we learn about that function at least a, a, a little bit um, and we see the, the challenges, the hurdles, how it works, and then we recruit. And when we recruit, I think we recruit a little bit better. So we always recruit late, obviously. So it's a bit, uh, it's a bit of a pain because uh, you've been struggling for You're some time. You, basically. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but it works quite well because then you, you recruit, I think, a little bit better. And I think also it gives you a, a better sense of, of how to manage that people afterwards. I mean, if you've never done public affair and you recruit a public affair manager, uh, it's gonna be difficult to kind of uh, feel uh, what, is, what is difficult for him or her and uh, how you can support them. So um, and that is also particular in, in our company, uh, th this kind of recruiting late because we chose a pass which is different from many SaaS company, which is we, we didn't really go for hyper growth and um, and uh, and super big rounds uh, every year. Even so, I just realized that I actually raised every year uh, for the past years. <laughs> um, we had a more gradual approach. Uh, we have a really kind of a long term approach also on the company. We're looking for, for profitability basically from from the beginning on. And what it means is when you build a company, which is a technology startup trying to be um, profitable versus hyperscaling is that you are always with super limited resources because you always need to demonstrate that you're super lean and with a super efficient team you make more than anyone else. Uh, but that worked pretty well for us. But I must say it's a little bit exhausting. Um, but um, I think we still have the juice within the team and it makes a lot of fun. I think we're also in this kind of very sportive culture within Diego, where we prefer to have a smaller team, super bonded um, and aligned on one goal altogether. And, and that works pretty well for us. That's a great piece of advice. I mean, don't hire anybody that you don't understand their, their daily work, because otherwise, how are you going to judge them or rate them or grade them actually, or even help them to do their jobs, right? If you don't understand what they're doing. That's why a lot of people, when they come to me, is like, I need a CTO. It's like, well, are you able to take a look at his job or her job and understand it and maybe grade it? No, not really then. Uh, that's not going to be successful, right? I know it's a bit of a far-fetched example, but in terms of operations, for instance, uh, I wanted to stop a, a little bit here because you scale up to 110 people uh, running in, in different countries, different cities, so operations must have been a real pain in the ass for you. First off, how many hours per, wor uh, per week do you work? Because you said you work quite a lot. I don't calculate that. Method. You don't count. That's probably too, mu too, too many. But one of the things I noticed is that y people are pretty reluctant to hire an operations person in the company because it's like, it's hard to justify. I cannot bill for this person if you're in services, for instance. And then when you hire them, it's like, why? what do we have to do to hire three more? When you see the effect that operations people br are brought into the company, I don't know, we hired the first one when, when we were 10, right? What was the right time for you to kind of like scale yourself as a CEO? That was a very long question, sorry about that. Um, I mean, if, 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 we, if I come back to the operations question, I mean, we are, it's a very kind of, again, like particular case, Diego is an operation company. It's a logistics company, it's a transportation company, so for everything is around running operations. Um, so we had to delegate that part pretty quickly um, and it's it's very intense operation. I have no idea how operations are being run in SaaS companies. In our case, you have to manage people that are working 24/7, uh, mechanics, 
um, but also in, like interact with with the product team and getting features rolled out to manage your fleet, manage your people. So it's very uh, intense, and it's it's for me it's a kind of a the 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 operations guy is is kind of a fireman. He's always extinguishing fires, and that is very very hard to maintain over time. So I'm, uh, I think we've been very, very lucky to have lots of nice people working in operations. Um, and it was very tough scaling that position to, uh, to, to the, the, the level it, it, it is right now. Because, yeah, you tend to burn yourself out on, on operations. Now, we were super lucky to, to, to find excellent people that had the experience previously, but we really took also the prof the profile that really came from logistics almost um, and from warehousing, uh, so it was really operation specific for Diego um, that we're not a, a, a afraid of of talking um, safety and security measures trainings um, uh, warehouse control stock management uh, it's it's yeah very 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 hardware very real uh, topics. How about the technology part? Because um, I, I, I want to challenge you here for a bit. A lot of companies claim they are a technology company, and all they do is they have an app, right? I'm not saying this is your case, but like, I'm trying to understand. Like, Uber wasn't a technology company because it, they were the first one in their field. But literally, the rest of them have been copycats. So the innovation is not much there, right? Um, how can you explain your version of we are a technology company to, for instance, investors who will not very often understand that level of technology, like the algorithm or the way you deploy your fleet locally with micro, uh, yeah, yeah. I think you the, know what uh, I mean? I mean, I always said we are a technology-driven company. <laughs> um, it's pretty obvious in our case, especially when you raise the first rounds, that we are not a pure tech player because we wanted cash to buy mopeds, <laughs> green mopeds. Um, so, yeah, it works out on that. I mean, we, we, we explained that we are basically enabling through technology uh, the, the possibility of sharing vehicles and uh, that we are using lots of technology on, on, the back, on the back office part to basically always try to balance um, the, the offer and the demand um, so that people have a vehicle available close by. <clears throat> but um, we never pretended to be a pure tech company. I mean, we, we are not just a technology company. Um, and uh, investors, I think, understood it and therefore didn't invest that much at the beginning. <laughs> um, because I think one of, the, one of the key things also, I mean, within, within at least venture capital, um, backing CapEx super intensive businesses it is not in the scope. Um, so we were we, we really got a lot of, of refusals um, and it took us a lot of time to find the first VC and the only one that we have on the cap table right now which is um, a pure player in sustainable and mobility investment so he knows very well what we are doing and he knows very well that we what, what he's doing is putting cash into a machine that is working profitable and that we are now able to finance mopeds with debt actually and not with equity but um, um, it worked out but we, we had a lot of struggle with let's say the, the, the traditional VC Spanish French German English um, I mean British we we pitched pretty much all of Europe hmm. um, and yeah I mean uh, we had to we, we had to went to, to go through that struggle a little bit it was a little bit of, of a bit strange as well honestly because Back in 2018 came all of the, the patinete, uh, and so the, the kick scooter trend. And, and, and I, I went back and called all of the investors and said, why, why did you fund five companies with 50 million each? Because they were not as humble as you. And they said, like, we're a fucking technology company. We're going to conquer the world. Whereas I think you've got a too much of a humble approach. Yes, I think we've been. I think I've been also w in my pitch towards investor way too humble and way too transparent and not not hustling enough probably. Um, maybe I would do it different the next time. But um, I mean, we are we are still pretty happy with the with the w with the the way we found. Let's say I also like counter examples is if 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 you go too much in the hassle in the hustle, 
uh, and you, you don't pay attention, you pretty you can also get results. Oh, yeah. You you'll get some investors that maybe don't understand your business and drive you um, to, for example push for some metrics that are not really important for you, but they think are important for the company, uh, which is which is uh, very hard. I have friends who, who, who had to go through that. Uh, we had to wait a little bit more time to get the right investor and the amount of cash that we needed, but it, we took it as an opportunity to basically get the company um, autonomous and profitable um, and grow from there. What, what we did also a lot is basically uh, we tried to find money other ways. I mean, if we were like, okay, if VCs don't not not gonna fund us, let's try to find alternative solutions. And there are many in the end. Um, the first one was me going to Germany and talking to the the um, the manufacturer of the mopeds and and just telling them we were buying their scooters, cutting wires, putting a black box, and that there were 200 people basically sharing three scooters, and that we would like invested? to. And they didn't invest. They actually right. gave us financing to buy 60 more scooters. Oh, wow. But it was a first jump start, and that actually allowed us then to raise the first business angel round. All right. Yeah. Uh, I think, like, and that was, that was a very good answer. Actually, you covered precisely. Uh, the next thing I wanted to go into is, like, it seems like a huge respect for you because you have a very humble approach to business. You've been very cash efficient. You haven't raised too, ma too much funds and all of that. And precisely, maybe that's the way, uh, it's a very contrarian uh, way of looking at things. So maybe that's the way that brought you to having 110 employees and being like so well known in these cities that you're operating, right? Perhaps the other way around would have been be more of a Silicon Valley tech bro saying like, we're going to conquer the world, we're going to raise 100 million in our Series A, and we're going to expand to the US, we're going to be the market dominant player and all of that. And then you would shrink back and then bridge round, then expand again and become an accordion. Yeah. Uh, startup, right? The, the the problem that we had first, we had two problems with with that. The first one is we were not competent to raise this type of of rounds and be like what what we saw with the kick scooter companies from Europe, where they were almost all serial founders. So they were pitching and saying, "I'm gonna put myself 10 million, and I'm just looking for the two VCs that are, are gonna join me." Obviously, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> um, and the second one is because we are not a fully digital company. Um, this hyperscaling um, and super quick expansion uh, means a lot of trouble because you're because you're scaling hardware that is not ready. Uh, and and that, basically, what we saw is and what we didn't really like is that it meant that you need to really actually stop being aligned with your own values if they are around sustainability, recycling. Uh, lifespan of vehicles, improving the vehicles over time, um, and you have to push a little bit too hard at the beginning already uh, with with vehicles that are maybe not yet ready to be scaled that much. So um, we actually stick to our plan. But uh, again, like it's it's uh, the two sides. I mean, it's very interesting because you had your opportunity of raising from the bigger VCs, and back when it was the you know it was a frenzy of the mopeds startups, and you know there were so many in Barcelona, there were like six, seven, eight, or maybe even ten at the same time. I don't remember, and that's when generic VCs invest in things because they they not only invest in the players, they invest in the game, right? And oftentimes they would invest in two competing companies because they're putting money into the sector, not so much into the like you know Sequoia investing into Uber and Lyft. It's like we're investing in the in the sector, right? However, once the the trend has passed and the wave has uh, died down, there are so many players. None of them is a clear winner. The only way for you to raise funds right now would be to go for more like corporate or sectorial big players, right? Not so much VCs will not be interested in mopeds in 2021. Or am I completely off the mark here? And there are different aspects. I mean, the, the first one is I think we demonstrated that we are actually more profitable than kick scooter companies uh, on the paper uh, and, 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 a, and on, a, on a consolidated annual financial perspective, which I think a lot of people don't get yet because the problem is that the vehicle itself is much more expensive. So yeah. basically, when we are buying one moped, they are buying 100 
kick scooter, but the profitability over the lifespan, it's a little bit like buying electric vehicles. Yeah. You need to look at the total cost of ownership and the result of yeah. the profitability at the end of the way, which is difficult. Um, and I think also, the, like what we are seeing now is a little bit, and I, what I really like, I think is, I hope it's gonna stick that way, is a lot more VCs are jumping into impact and sustainable investment. Uh, and I think, there is more and more awareness around the different paths that are possible. I think you still have to grow very quickly and that's important uh, for, for this kind of audience and I think it's also the, the challenging and nice part of entrepreneurship. But uh, doing things right, sticking to the, the, the values of the company, um, the, the social and, and, and climate responsibility uh, are getting more important and I think they can actually be uh, become uh, quite a significant competitive advantage and also very valuable to investors. Let, let's go let's go to the let's forward to the last part of the interview because I want to touch on something that has been brought up in the last interviews which I think is mental health and mental issues we've had all of us have suffered from them in the last two years I mean raise your hand if you experience some sort of like mental health issue in the last two years. I see too few hands. But like, okay, now, yeah, thanks for sharing. Um, like Vicente Marti said in our previous event, if, we had, if I had asked, do you know somebody who has experienced that in your immediate circles, it would be 100% of the, of the hands raised, right? What was your, uh, your worst day at the office? And what has, have you experienced? You want to share some stories? I mean, I'm pretty vocal about my imposter syndrome things on Twitter and social media, but I want to know if you've experienced something in the last two years, for instance. Um, I, I mean, there there have been a lot of difficult moments um, around. It can be around. Yeah, uh, we had so many topics with regulation, fundraising, uh, internal conflicts to manage. Um, I think, yeah, of course. I mean, it, it, I wouldn't define it as like a, yeah, a mental health. Yeah, to a certain degree, I think in the in the end, it's yeah, a mental force that you need to look for and that that you are lacking to some extent at some point. Um, and uh, as a CEO, you need just to find basically the kind of the um, the couple of tools that that back you up. <laughs> I don't know if it's sports, music, going out, uh, your co-founders, friends, family, uh, and just remember to stick to them from time to time to go back up the ladder. Um, but um, yeah, it's 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 a constant up and down. And the worst day at the office, honestly, I couldn't say. I mean, we 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 constantly have really difficult, or myself, I put myself in difficult. Uh, situations, but uh, but I I like it, and it's not like it's affecting me mentally too much, because I learned along the way to um, to kind of uh, protect myself from uh, feeling isolated or or feeling that I'm not at the level where I should be, uh, and because I'm I'm I have the luck also to have really good people around me that push me up and and bring me up in those moments, um, both in the company and outside. Uh, are, do you have any sort of mechanics for, you know, when you're feeling low as a CEO, you, you are at the helm of a company and you need to inspire and lead a lot of people. And whereas 10 years ago, 15 years ago, a CEO was not fragile, was indestructible, was like a fierce leader, strong hand, iron willed and whatnot. Nowadays, it's okay to show vulnerability, maybe not fragility, but vulnerability. So like, it's okay to not be okay, right? Do you have any sort of mechanisms for when you're feeling low, maybe not show it or so that it doesn't permeate into everybody or to the company? Uh, I think I, I do definitely agree with this like new approach also of thinking that that empathy and v showing vulnerability is actually something good. Um, but obviously you need to just take care of, of how to whom you're showing it. Um, showing it too much to your own investor or board members for example. It should be relative to the topics that you want to address, and maybe because you want to ask for support and you want something in return, you you need some some backup from them. And I think then also, I think it's more towards my my own founders. I think uh, there are certain person within the companies that you you should better show your vulnerability because they will detect it and help you. Um, and then there are maybe other groups within the company where you don't maybe want to show that moment. Uh, because you're struggling with cash at that point of time and you don't want everybody to feel bad and go back home stressed and think they might lose their job within a week or two. 
because you're going to solve it anyway and you know it um, and and so yeah that's it basically you just choose a little bit the audience and try to um, you need to stand out and you need to stick for the company and you, you need also to represent the motivation the culture of the company so um, I think it's a good balance that you need to always try to fi find and I, I don't think it's very easy um, but it's definitely a super nice learning experience I think it's just just the CEO it's it's affecting uh, probably most managers, depending on their ups and downs, um, but it's it, it's a new yeah. for me at least was a really nice uh, learning experience uh, from a personal point of view. It is very hard because you know sometimes it's impending that some disaster is impending. You know you're going to solve it. You would like to, in the spirit of transparency, share it with the team, but you know you're going to solve it. So if you communicate it. Maybe they will. They will get. You believe you're going to solve it, yeah. Most of the time, I mean, I mean, I'm speaking from personal experience, right? It's like I know this contract is going to come through, or like, but like, if you share it with the team, it's not like you want to conceal it, but you don't want to create cost for alarm. Two so quick questions before opening the floor for questions from my side. One of one of them is like, what can we expect from Diego in the immediate future or in 2022? Um. There are different different things that, that you we can share without scaring no, no, your can, investors. No, no. We are we are pretty transparent uh, on on what we're doing and what what we are what our ambition is. Um, obviously, what we want to do is is we have a European kind of uh, feeling. Obviously, French people living in Germany, moving to Spain to to found a company. Um, so we would like to bring our solutions to much more uh, European uh, cities, and we're gonna do so. Um, so that, that's just for the kind of replication expansion topic. Um, what we also want to do is obviously we don't want to like just stop where we are. And one of the big thing that we wanted to um, to to reach and which we haven't reached yet totally is uh, giving the possibility to people to really ride every day and use Diego as their main transportation. Uh, right now we are, as as probably everybody knows, we have a price per minute and we have a rather like kind of complementary occasional uh, usage case um, and so what we are trying to do with several different um, ways let's say and one is a, a kind of a perks approach a b2b approach where it kind of a gym for less gym pass stuff you get a, a monthly pass which is discounted by your company also let's say um, uh, Mars base is gonna pay you uh, 20 or gonna pay 25 percent of that subscription so you're gonna get really low to a super interesting and attractive price um, to use um, Diego to do your commute every day um, and, and use it quite intensely without thinking too much of the total cost because that's something that we felt um, is, is pretty much needed uh, that people want. Uh, it, within Diego also we have like all of our employees have free Diego. Uh, unlimited uh, for now and we see the value that they see in, in using it and some of them still use bikes and other things I, I'm not saying they are just mm -hmm. using Diego um, and we feel that that's something that we could also be scaling um, and and delivering to more people uh, in in Barcelona and in cities where we are already present last question everybody gets a useless superpower what's yours what is your useless superpower something you do exceptionally well but it's fucking useless you do it every day. Every day. Every something you do every day. You're like, what do I know this for? Like, you know, can you lick your elbow? Do no. you know songs? <laughs> the other way around. Like, can you read right to uh, left? I can speak <laughs> German, but I don't use it. Yeah, it's, uh, that's, <laughs> I would say it's pretty useful in your industry. So, um, uh, no, I don't think I, I'm not, I don't know if I have uh, some exceptional skills. Maybe Tim knows better for me. Uh, from you the want to answer for him? Uh, that's pretty useful in my case, by my uh, book, but uh, yeah, maybe not as a CEO. <laughs> we'll take that one. Last one, really quick. How can we help you and Diego from all of our community, of all of these lo lovely people around the world? Start crying. I think the uh, I think first of all um, we we are very thankful towards the the Barcelona community in general, uh, and I think uh, what what. What the community can give us back is um, is what we've always tried to get back is just feedback and and how we can improve, and be honest and true about what's wrong and what needs to be improved uh, or what new offers would be needed. Um, so we are really kind of uh, um, 
struggling actually and trying to, to push to get as much qualitative insights from, from our own communities uh, or from potential new users uh, like you who just subscribe and never use us and, and try to understand what do we need to do to, to get you rolling. It's too <laughs> cold, man. It's too cold. <laughs> Mopeds are cold. <laughs> Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, big applause for Bam. Thank you.